Good afternoon, and welcome to this month's Young Leaders Circle event. I'm Raihan Salam, the president of the Manhattan Institute, and I'm excited to be joined today by Brett Stevens. Brett has been a columnist for the New York Times since 2017. Before that, he spent a decade as the Global View columnist for the Wall Street Journal. Brett also spent two years as the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, becoming the youngest person ever to hold the role when he uh, was serving there. Throughout his career, Brett has earned a global reputation for being able to cut to the heart of the most vexing policy challenges. On issues ranging from the conflict in the Middle East and the targeting of political dissidents in Russia to the intellectual climate on America's college campuses, his thinking and writing have set the terms of debate. In 2013, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Commentary. A year later, he released America in Retreat, The New Isolationism and the Coming Global Disorder, one of the most perceptive examinations of America's evolving attitude toward its unique role in the world. And this year only, Brett is serving as the editor of Sapir, a new limited edition journal of ideas that will be publishing four issues over the coming months. I've been looking forward to this conversation for some time, but the events of the past few days have only made it more timely. Brett, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. It's good to be with you, Rehan. Brett, let's begin with the headlines and what is happening in Israel and Gaza. It seems that the consensus expectation is that a ceasefire deal will be reached in the next few days. In his call with Prime Minister Netanyahu yesterday, President Biden expressed his hope that a ceasefire would be reached quickly, while also expressing his support for Israel's right to self-defense. What do you anticipate unfolding over the coming days? Is the goal of the Israeli government to degrade Hamas's capabilities? Uh, is the real audience here Hezbollah? How are you making sense of this moment? Well, I think the real audience is Iran, which has become... Uh as it is the patron of Hezbollah in, in Lebanon and Syria, uh, has become the patron of, of Hamas. Now, uh, Israel is limited in what it can do because um, it has uh, essentially decided to live with a Hamas government in, in Gaza for as long as Hamas is able to remain in power. And the game that, uh, I call the I use the word game advisedly, but uh, the the game that Israel has played has been to uh, degrade, uh, attempt to degrade Hamas's military capabilities um, to the point that the lull between the periodic wars, and we've now had one in two thousand nine, two thousand twelve, two thousand fourteen, uh, and two thousand and twenty one. Uh, is as long as uh, as uh, is uh, is possible. It's very hard to predict the next 24 or 48 hours. Um, part of it depends on Israel wanting to achieve some kind of decisive headline strike, which will give uh, Netanyahu and his government the ability to say, we won, we really hurt them, Hamas has been uh, uh, devastated. They had tried to have that kind of, uh, de decapitation strike is the wrong term, but uh, a, uh, a devastating blow against Hamas's uh, underground infrastructure. It's unclear just how successful uh, that that strike uh, was. And so they're probably looking for something else. What that something else is, I don't know. But the last thing I'll say is, as in all wars, the enemy gets a vote. And uh, Hamas has its own uh, uh, calculus. And if it has the resources to continue to fire volleys of missiles, at uh, Israel, it might well it might well continue to do so. Remember, Hamas is not just fighting Israel. Hamas is fighting Fatah for political supremacy within the Palestinian community. This isn't the first time conflict has broken out between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, but something that does seem unique about this current conflict is the level of violence within Israel itself uh, between. Jewish and Israeli Arab communities. What do you make of that? And what might it portend for life in Israel going forward? Yeah, it's extremely worrisome uh, because uh, we've, well, 20 years ago or 21 years ago at the beginning of the Second Intifada, you had something uh, akin to this. But um, for the most part, relations, which uh, at least uh, at the margins and from the outside seem to be getting better. Clearly that has not uh, happened. And so in town, towns like Akko and Lod, I think the intercommunal violence has been absolutely uh, shocking. Now, what I hear anecdotally 
is it's not quite as bad as has been made to seem and that some of the mob violence is coming from kind of the fringes of both Arab and, and Jewish, the Jewish societies, not quite at the heart of it. But look, you know, uh, people always say that I, I, I have, uh, or people often say that I'll never criticize Israel. Israel has a long way to go in terms of properly integrating the Arab Israeli population into the mainstream of, of Israeli society. And there have been a series of policy, long-term policy blunders, including the uh, under-policing of uh, Arab Israeli uh, communities, uh, cities and towns uh, for, for a long time, uh, failure to properly integrate Arab Israelis into economic life, real uh, unmistakable ethnic discrimination. And Israel has to take a hard look at itself and see how it can do better. I'm a member of the advisory board of the Israel Democracy Institute, which has been working on this, but it's one of the few organizations that really pays it uh, any uh, any serious, uh, serious attention. So uh, Israel needs to do better here. I wonder uh, when you talk about this under policing, how much of this is a desire to be uh, culturally sensitive, the desire to protect the autonomy of Arab citizens of Israel and their communities, perhaps in a misguided way, but how much of it is a reflection of an ultimately benign impulse uh, to try to respect some form of cultural pluralism in an Israeli society that is enormously diverse, where the Haredi population has its own imperatives and interests and sensitivities as well? Yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly right. There is a kind of uh, I mean, I'm coining this as we speak, but a kind of a convenient communitarianism where you think, well, just let the communities deal with, with their own problems in part because there is a, uh, a deep-seated reluctance, I think, among mainstream Israeli society to really integrate Arabs into their own, uh, into, into the mainstream of, of life. So a kind of um, uh, not, not exactly benign, but a sort of a, an idea that you know, different towns, different areas should take care of their own uh, is is not only convenient for a lot of Israelis, but it's also convenient for lo local power brokers in in Arab uh, in Arab life and in Arab towns like Nazareth and so on. Uh, it allows them to accrue uh, local political power uh, without having to have the kind of it, sort of deep interaction they have to have with the rest of Israeli life, and so. You know, again, it's something that requires genuine work uh, in uh, in Israeli society. We were. It, it, it's worth noting, however, that we were or seem to be on the cusp of having an Arab-Israeli party form part of a governing coalition. Just literally the day before uh, the missiles started falling on on Jerusalem and the rest of uh, rest of Israel. So I don't want to leave the impression that. There's, there's no hope or no progress in, in that area, but it's just clearly far from complete. Is your sense that uh, when you think about things like the kind of mainstreaming of Arab citizens of Israel in some dimensions, is it that there is a secularizing population as well as a more observant population? Is it partly a class difference? How do you understand you know, which Arab citizens of Israel are embracing the state and feel the sense of greater inclusion, and those that don't, those that feel excluded, marginalized, et cetera? I mean, obviously, it's a very diverse picture, and you do have prominent Arab Israelis who have integrated very well in, in, in Israeli life. Uh, I hesitate to draw comparisons between the Arab Israeli experience and the African American uh, uh, experience. There are, in many ways, uh, uh, fundamentally different, not least because African Americans are, I think, vastly more integrated into American life or, you know, part of not just ordinary American life, but the power structures of American life that you have in Arab Israeli uh, communities. There's also another difference, which is that um, uh, uh, <laughs> this this is an English speaking country, black or white. It's not the same Arab uh, Arabs versus uh, uh, Arabs versus Jews. It's 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 a complex and difficult picture, and and it goes and it varies actually from community to community, from Lod to Nazareth to Haifa. Um, uh, it's it's very different, and and I just again hesitate to draw broad conclusions. And there's a Bedouin community in the south, which is an entirely different uh, and highly complex and interesting uh, interesting story. So I mean, we could probably expatiate for hours on uh, on the subject. <laughs> 
What do you think of the press coverage of the conflict so far in the U.S. in the English language media? Uh, you know, one could argue that you've seen a kind of cultural revolution in prestige media in the United States in its uh, understanding of racial dynamics here at home that seems to be influencing the coverage of the conflict in Israel and Gaza. But, but I wonder about your sense, having covered this issue for, for many years. Oh, I, I, I tend to be pretty critical of the uh, caliber of, of US and foreign coverage of uh, the conflict. I think it's often, um, it draws on very lazy tropes. Uh, it it uh, there's a kind of an underhandedness or a sneakiness to some of the coverage that uh, is dishonest. I forgot where it was, so I hope it's not the Times. But there was one one article which quoted uh, a man named Avram Berg as a kind of an Israeli, as a sort of Israeli leading Israeli voice. And it's true that about twenty or twenty five years ago, Avram Berg was speaker of the Israeli Knesset, not a particularly powerful position. And he has since become the uh, Ramsey Clark of uh, of Israeli life, which is, you know, his right to do, but to sort of quote him as if he represents a kind of a serious strain of opinion in, in Israeli society is just like, you know, shamefully dishonest, right? You know, without giving, uh, without giving readers a fair sense that this guy really speaks only for uh, uh, for himself. And you see those of us who have sort of been up close with uh, Israeli life or the conflict in general kind of see this pattern um, uh, continuously. I mean, another, maybe to me, the most uh, dishonest or not dishonest, but misleading, I think is a better word, uh, misleading habit is the is the habit of counting casualties on both sides to say, look, Israel has only had eight or 10 or whatever casualties versus multiples more among Palestinians. Yes, that's true because Israel is taking active measures to defend civilians, defend its own civ civilian population with multi-billion dollar investments in things like Iron Dome, shelters, and so on, whereas it's essential to the Hamas, Hamas's tactics to expose civilians to, uh, to uh, enemy, uh, enemy fire. And that's 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 a kind of a common that's a distinction that anyone who who really understands the concept gets but is lost when you simply have these numericals saying you know 10 israelis died versus 100 palestinians or whatever uh, whatever the difference is um, uh, you you had mentioned sapir a limited edition journal that i'm editing for four issues but in our first issue we had two really exceptionally good pieces uh, one by mati friedman a former reporter for the associated press wrote a wonderful memoir of his time as an Israeli soldier. He's, he's a fantastic writer uh, in general. And then another important one by Einat uh, Wilf, a former labor member of Knesset, so someone on the political left, who simply made the point that this effort to graft um, American or Northern Irish or South African uh, uh, racial or ethnic dilemmas onto the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is um, is uh, fallacious and phony and mis uh, and misleading. If you walk the streets in Jaffa, a neighborhood in, in south of Tel Aviv, I would challenge you to tell the you know to be able to tell the difference by simply looking at the color of people's skin between Jews and uh, and and Arabs. It's 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 impossible. So the Arab-Israeli conflict is many things, but it's not the American. It's not America's racial dilemma. It's it's a completely different different story. And when we sort of lazily, when we, when, when some people lazily graft America's dilemmas onto uh, Israel or the Israeli Arab di dilemmas, they are uh, misinforming themselves much more than they're informing themselves. We've discussed the press reaction, uh, the press coverage, but there's also been an interesting divide within the Democratic Party coalition. Mm -hmm. It seems that at least on the level of rhetoric, President Biden and the Biden White House uh, have endeavored to make clear that they support Israel's right to defend itself. It's also the case that there is a deep ideological conflict brewing within the Democratic Party. There's a generational conflict, and you do see some younger, 
hard left voices who seem uh, to take criticizing Israel, uh, championing uh, the Palestinian cause uh, as really a core part of their worldview. Uh, and I wonder what you make of that, where you see that going, not in the next few days, but over a longer time horizon. Do you think that this might jeopardize the kind of bipartisan consensus in favor of a robust uh, alliance, a robust partnership with Israel? Yeah, well, I've been worried about this for, for quite some time because it's clear that the progressive side of the Democratic Party has been moving in an anti-Israel and anti-Zionist uh, and sometimes anti-Semitic direction for, uh, for years now. Um, and, uh, you know, partly this is on account of the kind of, I think, misbegotten idealism of uh, uh, well, of young younger people uh, of uh, of the far left that wants to see in the Palestinians a liberation struggle, you know, akin to the liberation struggle in uh, South Africa. There are lots of causes for it, but the essential, to me, the essential fact is that the left or the far left in America is now effectively fellow traveling with a uh, right wing, bigoted, uh, religiously fundamentalist movement that is hostile to everything they claim to uh, support and defend, at least when it comes to uh, politics in the United States. I mean, I once got into an argument with the playwright Tony Kushner, who's famously the author of Angels in America, a leading and I think path-breaking uh, gay American Jewish playwright, very left-wing, who brought a, a, a really viciously anti-Israel play to the Lower East Side of Manhattan about 10 or 12, uh, 12 years ago. I thought it was anti-Semitic. Um, but after the, after the, the play, I, I said to him, I said, when, when do you next plan to stage, uh, what are your plans of staging angels in America at, um, the Islamic university of Gaza? He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, just, just ask yourself, wh where is angels in America likelier to be staged in Tel Aviv university, which you seem to consider a, a, a den of, of, uh, fascistic iniquity or at the Islamic University of, of Gaza, which, which espouses values um, that, uh, uh, that are uh, anathema, never mind to your play, but to your very being. Uh, and people use the, these terms like pinkwashing. I, I don't know quite why that has become a, a term of art, but the simple reality is that if you're a woman, if you're gay, if you're uh, a contrarian, if, you're, if you see yourself as a dissident, if you see yourself as any sort of other, Right, the only country in the Middle East where you would want to be that other uh, is uh, is Israel. So why why does the left fellow travel? Never mind with the Palestinian people. That's one thing, but with a movement Hamas that um, violently wants to suppress everything that they are supposedly for. And I've I've never had that question honestly answered for me by by people who are now busy uh, raising placards for for Gaza. The conflict in Israel is happening against the backdrop of a rapidly changing region. The Abraham Accords, which normalize relations between Israel and the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan, seem to herald the prospect of an Israeli-Arab alliance of sorts, primarily in the interest of containing Iranian influence. But there remains the unsettled question of whether the Biden White House will reach a new nuclear deal with Iran, mm -hmm. as well as Iran's continued military adventurism uh, and its influence in Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. What's your read of the larger regional landscape? Well, look, I think the Abraham Accords are the most promising thing to happen in the Middle East uh, since the Camp David Accords of the 1970s. And they're important not simply because they expand the uh, ambit, if you will, of, uh, of peaceful diplomatic relations for Israel and its, and its Arab neighbors, but because I think they represent a kind of a, um, an intellectual revolution uh, in terms of uh, the understanding of the Arab-Israeli uh, uh, conflict. It's important that the UAE and Bahrain, and by extension, uh, Morocco and Sudan, uh, agreed to have diplomatic relations with Israel in exchange for nothing. I mean, Egypt got the Sinai back, right? Um, uh, Jordan regularized a, a a border that they had to, uh, to they, they had to normalize, um, uh, and they did get actually a tiny sliver of of land uh, back from 1967. Um, what they got actually was 
uh, the recognition that trying to uh, ostracize Israel from from the Middle East was was bad for them. It was bad intellectually. Was bad strategically. Was bad uh, tactically. It was bad intellectually because pretending that the center of uh, the Middle East's um, pathologies or the cause of the Middle East pathologies was the existence of the state of Israel uh, was ha had fundamentally misled the region for for generations. Israel is an asset to the Arab world, not not a not a, li a, a liability. And it was important strategically, I think, in this era of American uh, hesitancy and withdrawal to have uh, as an ally a militarily capable state that is willing to stand up forcefully against Iranian imperialism. Iran is the great imperialist regime of uh, the Middle East. It's an, it's an imperialist regime, whether in Syria, in Lebanon, uh, in, 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 in Yemen, of course, in Iraq, to a large extent in Afghanistan. Again, a point that I never hear made by my um, friends, if that's the word, my friends on the left, uh, who are otherwise against imperialism. Well, and also, by the way, it's domestic ethnic politics, it's oppression of its domestic minorities, and what, but that's a whole separate issue. Oh, yeah. I uh, mean, when, when are you going to hear about the rights of Arab Iranians or, or, or Azeri? Or, I mean, it, it just, you know, it's, it's, it's endless, uh, uh, Balochis and so on. Um, so uh, so the, it, you had this kind of uh, revolution in the region, which I think was extremely ho hopeful. And what the Biden administration ought to be doing is pushing hard to regularize the most important, currently subterranean relationship in the region, which is between Jerusalem and Riyadh. Um, if Saudi Arabia can make peace with uh, peace with Israel, I think that would be a real sea change. In effect, it's happened. El Al jets can overfly Saudi uh, airspace. There's vast cooperation at the at the intelligence uh, at the intelligence level, but that would really represent a kind of an intellectual transformation and a. And, and a willingness by the Saudi regime, as problematic as it is in many ways, to start thinking of itself as a 21st century uh, power rather than in, in very distinctly uh, 20th and even uh, uh, 12th century terms. Is it your sense that the Saudis fear what recognition of Israel and a deeper, more open relationship would do to its stability? Is that the anxiety that there would yeah, be? There's, there's no question that I think MBS, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, uh, very difficult and uh, um, callow, maybe that's the word, character that he is, um, uh, that Mohammed bin Salman would like to do it. And there is um, fierce and in fact, uh, open uh, opposition within the upper ranks of the Saudi family, uh, Prince Turkey, whom I know, former ambassador of the United States and head of head of Saudi intelligence has been vocal in his opposition. So until Salman, I think, feels he has a better grip on, on Saudi power structures and his king himself as opposed to crown prince, uh, it, might, it might not happen, but a lot is happening all the same, which would have been unimaginable just a few years ago. I want to take a sharp turn from the Middle East to the Far East. Mm -hmm. uh, many observers have been surprised by how much the Biden administration's China policy resembles the Trump administration's, yeah. certainly in broad strokes. The Biden White House has described the persecution of the Uyghurs as genocide. They've kept tariffs in place, uh, among other things. What does President Biden need to do to make good on its ostensible goal of containing Chinese power? Uh, the Obama administration's pivot to Asia aimed to do that, but there was a broad sense uh, among our Asian allies, certainly, that that was, uh, you know, more in rhetoric than in deed. Yeah, it's a very good question. And look, you know, one of the sort of pleasant surprises for me as a someone who's always been on the on the to the right of center and, and even further to the right on foreign policy issues is that the Biden administration, I think, is a pretty sober uh, has, has so far been uh, been pretty sober about you know the American the overall American geopolitical uh, challenge for new rising uh, so-called near peer competitors. Uh, what do they have to do? It would be great to see the administration somehow reopen a new version of the TPP. I think that's the greatest economic hedge against uh, uh, Chinese assertions of economic power in the region. It's a way of further entrenching America's place in uh, economic place in the Pacific Basin as the cornerstone of, of an economic, uh, a de facto economic alliance. 
I think it has to do a lot to restore deterrence in Korea that was lost uh, during the Trump years. People forget that Trump had um, a policy towards North Korea that would have, you know, would have would have uh, shocked Wendy Sherman. I mean, it was it was uh, uh, actually one of the great surprises for me of the Trump years is that the same people who fulminated against uh, the Obama administration's uh, very calibrated overtures to North Korea were had complete comfort with Trump. Uh, glad-handing uh, a despot like uh, Kim Jong-un. The most important relationship, obviously, is with Taiwan. Um, and uh, I think the Trump, uh, I think the Biden administration has been pretty good on the subject of standing up for uh, Taiwanese, um, uh, I should be careful here, not sovereignty, but uh, Taiwan's, uh, Taiwan's rights to remain a, a self-governing, uh, uh, self-governing, country that is capable of defending itself. And so um, arms sales to Taiwan that give it, that would make the Chinese think very hard about an invasion uh, are steps in, would be, would be steps in the right direction. The, the larger question, Rehan, is are we prepared to understand that we face not one, but two near peer military competitors who have to be taken seriously, who are looking for uh, new forms of asymmetric advantage to deny us access to our to to the Far East to defend uh, uh, to defend our allies. Are we going to invest in technologies like um, hypersonics and uh, you know uh, six generation fighters to give us the kind of qualitative military edge that we need against a Chinese a very willful. Uh, and highly nationalistic uh, and expansionistic uh, uh, Chinese super state. John Kerry, the president's envoy for climate change, has already visited China, but the Chinese government has voiced some skepticism that the U.S. and China will be able to cordon off climate change and cooperate there while having a more contentious relationship in other domains. More broadly, it does seem as though when you're looking at democratic foreign policy hands, when you look within the administration itself, it does seem as though there are those who take, call it a more traditional view, uh, that we need to contain Chinese power. And there are others who do seem to, because of their belief that climate policy is absolutely central, uh, who do believe that we should avoid a more, call it confrontational course, because the need for cooperation there. So, so I'm curious, what do you make of that situation, the place of climate and how that ought to inform or shape uh, the relationship with China? I think the idea that we have any influence whatsoever over China's climate policies is farcical, whether we have a cooperative or a competitive relationship. The China has uh, economic needs that it's going to uh, uh, meet with or e energy requirements that it's going to meet one way or the other, whether it builds a lot of nuclear power plants or coal plants or or, or both. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to have to simply accept that for the foreseeable future, the two countries that are going to emit the most carbon, uh, China and and India, uh, are um, are not going to be particularly receptive to our, you know, to our overtures in terms of radically altering their their carbon footprint. So what we can do, I think, sensibly um, is to uh, invest heavily in uh, climate mitigation technologies um, that might someday reach um, uh, cost levels and, and achieve efficiencies where it makes economic sense to adopt them. Uh, and whether it's the next generation of, of uh, nuclear technologies that are safer and, of course, uh, don't emit greenhouse gases, um, whether it's a, a move to, you know, much more of a battery powered, you know, vehicle fleet uh, in the next uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years. That, of course, has its own set of, of, of environmental challenges, but that's, a, uh, that's another story. Um, other forms of efficiencies with, with, with wind and solar, although I'm, I'm, I've been a kind of a lifelong skeptic of both technologies, uh, um, we'll have to see, but I think the only way we're going to solve the climate crisis is to innovate our way out of it um, and then have the Chinese, Indians, and the rest of the, can I say it, the rest of the third world uh, come along because these, these new technologies make as much economic sense as they do environmental sense. 
a country like China is never going to become environmentally con uh, environmentally sensible until there is as good an economic case for it as there is an environmental one. That's my bottom line. A cynic might argue that the project of decarbonizing the American economy at a moment when the United States has emerged as a kind of hydrocarbon superpower, uh, where our ability to access our oil and gas reserves to unlock them has been a huge economic advantage. At a moment when China dominates rare earth minerals that are essential to any number of renewable technologies, you know, a cynic could argue that this is a, a crazy kind of self-sabotage. And that even if we don't kind of ask for Chinese cooperation, that implicitly this is surrendering a big advantage that we have over the Chinese. What do you think of that line of argument? Oh, well, I, I, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to that, to that argument. I mean, look, let me, let me add a couple of qualifiers. Um, I think that if we look hard enough, we're going to find plenty of rare earth here in the United States uh, and or in, in, in friendlier territories. The Chinese ha have as much of the market as they do because they've been willing to mine it. And we, for many, for, for a variety of reasons, impose all kinds of restrictions on mining. There's one, I think, one mine in California, I forgot exactly where, that where, where we do have seemingly, uh, I think, abundant has to be used spare, carefully, but, you know, uh, uh, supplies of rare earth, but between us, Canada, I mean, this is a this is a big place, and you you'll you'll, you'll find stuff. Uh, I think the, the 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 fracking revolution has not just been uh, a remarkable achievement in terms of our supply of hydrocarbons, but actually our supply of uh, hydrocarbons that have improved our carbon footprint because uh, natural gas is better than coal when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, uh, the CO2, our CO2 fit footprint, if you kind of look at the, the trend lines, it's, it's clear that, that the move toward, uh, toward fracking has been uh, a fantastic and possibly long-term bridge to a much more climate neutral um, or uh, carbon neutral uh, uh, footprint. And we should have, we should have much more of it. Uh, as things stand now, the, because of because of the way American law works, uh, there are limits to how much the Biden administration can do to impose curbs on uh, uh, impose curbs on on the on, on fracking on, on on lifting hydrocarbons. I mean, obviously they've done so in federal lands, uh, which is which is one limit. But you know, it's not all of America's is a federal land, so. Uh, my sense is that we're going to be a fracking country for a very long time, maybe probably m most of my adult life, and perhaps when I'm 60 or 70, new technologies will be uh, mature and it will make sense to move uh, uh, to move to something else. Um, but again, you know, I mean, I, I as the Obama administration figured out there are simply str there are strong public limits on what go governments can do uh, for to achieve climate nirvana. And if you if you don't remember that, just think of what happened to Macron when he tried to raise the price of gas in in France by a few uh, uh, by a few centimes and found yellow vests uh, protesting uh, in uh, in the streets. The efforts to tax energy or increase prices on energy tend not to go down too well with the sort of voters that uh, the Democratic Party especially needs to attract. Brett, you are famously an Atlanticist. Uh, you are someone who is a deep believer uh, in liberalism properly understood and classical liberalism. Uh, and as such, uh, you've had a longstanding interest in the European Union. The European Union has had a very disappointing vaccine rollout, yeah. administering about half as many doses per 100 residents as both Britain and the United States. And at the beginning of the pandemic, you did not see European solidarity. Rather, you saw a lot of uh, you know, vaccine nationalism or pandemic nationalism mm -hmm. in which you saw countries instituting bans on the export of certain medical supplies and the like. Do you think that the pandemic has altered the trajectory of the European Union as a project? Or do you think that some of these fiscal measures that Brussels has embraced are going to uh, basically deepen European federalism and, and kind of rescue the European project? I think the European project is in very deep trouble. I mean, I, I, I was in Brussels the day the switchover happened from Belgian francs to uh, 
uh, to Euros. I remember being in the uh, in the Grand Place and going to the local ATM and getting Euros out of the machine. And I thought this was, you know, a huge, huge moment in history that I would, you know, tell my kids about. Clearly, that hasn't happened. Uh, and the European project is, I mean, the this is only the latest failure the, of of European uh, uh, federalism. Um, the fiscal mess following the financial crisis of 2008, 2009 was another failure, which really tested the limits of, um, you know, so-called uh, solidarity. The uh, the um, crisis, the immigration crisis of 2015 was, was another moment. You are clearly seeing Central Europe, uh, states like Hungary and Poland in ways that I don't particularly like, but clearly uh, moving in their own direction when it comes to uh, their their choice of, of uh, domestic or uh, uh, or foreign policies. I don't think Brexit will be the first exit that we see, or, or rather the last exit that we see from uh, 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 from Europe. Um, and I, I just don't. I, I think it, it, it's a project that is um, that is failing, and it's failing largely because the people who were driving it, in my view, became far too ambitious for what it should be. They should have approach things with, with a much lighter hand. There was a great virtue to it. When I was a kid, it used to be known as the European Economic Community or then the European uh, Community. It was terrific to move from Italy to France to Belgium and so on without having to go through uh, uh, customs. There's a great virtue in having uh, French 20-year-olds uh, uh, when when the UK was in the EU, EU you know, working there and being, you know, or British college students on an Erasmus exchange program in Madrid or, or whatever. So the, 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 the idea is essentially a very healthy and a very sound one, but then it became a program of, you know, an effort to create a super state. Um, ever closer uh, union, right. Ever closer union run by people who had been elected by nobody uh, from countries that matter to nobody. So you'd get a Luxembourgian president of the European Union and the, both the French and the Germans would say, you know, what makes this guy or woman so, so special? So, uh, and, and also finally, a tremendous amount of economic and technical, both incompetence and corruption in Brussels. I covered Brussels for the Wall Street Journal for about three years. Um, and it makes Washington look like, uh, I don't know, um, Apple or Microsoft as, you know, a fountain of, uh, you know, innovativeness and and uh, competitive spirit it's it's kind of stunning in that respect to to spend some time there so the european union did itself in i think through excessive ambition and through arrogance and whether it can be rescued is an open question we have a number of questions from our audience that uh, I ought to get to, but I have a few more questions for you before we get there. So um, one, speaking of acute challenges, uh, I wonder what you uh, are thinking about the fate of France. Uh, there was an open letter recently from a group of retired generals suggesting the country's social disintegration was so advanced, there might be need for some extra political intervention, uh, you know, given French history, that, that's not an idle threat. The sentiments of the letter were endorsed by Marine Le Pen, the leader of the nationalist right, who polls suggest will once again be Macron's main challenger in this year's election. Uh, there have also been widely publicized instances of Islamist violence, which is driving much of the discontent. Um, is it melodramatic to worry about France's stability? Or do you think that this will all come out in the wash somehow? Well, I mean, when you think back to 2002, you had um, uh, you had uh, Chirac beating Le Pen's father um, uh, by 80 to 20 or something like that, 81 to 19. Uh, now, from what I've seen from recent polling, Marine Le Pen might win in the first round of polling. Now, whether she wins... Uh, Second round is is another question, but there's no doubt that the National Front is getting uh, much stronger. They don't call it the Fifth Republic for nothing, um, and I think that's worth that's worth recalling. So so we could have a Sixth Republic or something something of the sort. I mean, the the, the sources of French discontent are. I mean, that's a yet a, 
yet another you know long story. <laughs> um, and but what what's notable is you have now had um, Chirac tried it in the late 1990s to reform the economy. Uh, then uh, Sarko came in promising to reform the economy, Francois Hollande, now Macron. So four successive presidents who have tried to pull a Thatcher um, on, on France's etatiste sort of regime. And none of them have really succeeded. And, you know, life in France is very beautiful. It's a country with extraordinary natural and cultural resources, but it's a very unhappy place as well. Um, what I felt was interesting about that letter is that it was complaining about kind of woke to use to use an American term, you know, kind of the the encroachment of uh, woke racialist mentalities in France, which cuts against the grain of the secular, you know, the secular ethos of the French state. And it was funny to see the French complain about a, an American uh, intellectual invasion as a, you know as opposed to the usual direction, which is American conservatives complaining that all these terrible ideas from France are now uh, you know, suffocating uh, or, or, or uh, uh, perverting you know, American academic and, and intellectual life. So it goes to show that you know, funny things move in two directions. You were born in Mexico City and I've written I was, I was, I was born in, in just to avoid a, a Barack Obama situation. I was born in the United States. I've got oh. a birth certificate, but I was raised oh, in Forgive Mexico. me, forgive me. Yeah. Uh, you, you, but I, as I understand it, you were raised in Mexico City as a, yeah. as a young boy um, and have written about the country and its struggles to achieve stability and the rule of law. Mexico is absolutely essential to the United States for a great many things, but also, uh, you know, with regard to regularizing migrant flows uh, and much else. Now, now, you've previously argued that Mexico was in danger of becoming a failed state. Yeah. And I wonder, uh, you know, about how you're thinking about the state of Mexico right now and what the Biden administration, what Americans writ large can do to help shore up the Mexican state, if anything. So uh, when... Uh... Lopez Obrador came to power, I guess people call him AMLO, um, uh, came to power in 2018. I wrote a column widely denounced by many of my readers um, saying that uh, Mexico had elected its own left-wing version of Donald Trump, um, uh, you know, a kind of a, uh, an incompetent populist. And the last three years have, I think, um, richly validated my... Uh, my thinking. Uh, the state of the Mexican economy, which was pretty bad when he came to power, has only gotten worse. The handling of the pandemic has been uh, uh, incompetent. Large areas of Mexico have essentially been ceded to uh, the narcos uh, uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the country, kind of a social... I mean, if, there's, if you hear less about uh, uh, narco violence in Mexico, it's only because the government has given up, uh, which is, you know, terrible for people in, you know, towns that most Americans haven't, you know, haven't Culiacan, Zacatecas and places like that. Um, and, uh, and as you said, it's a, it's a serious problem for the United States because what you're now seeing is a kind of Colombianization of Mexico. Uh, I'm talking about Colombia back in the 1980s and 1990s, except that of course Mexico is directly on, uh, on the US border. I wrote another column, this was before the pandemic in November 2019, saying uh, that Mexico needed a kind of a surge strategy against narcos similar to what um, the US employed in Iraq uh, back in 2007, 2000 and, uh, uh, 2008. And some numbskull at the Federalist you know, seemed to think that what I was su called, suggesting was that the United States send the 3rd Infantry Division to Mexico. I was saying that Mexico needed to surge its armed forces into ungoverned territory, but uh, uh, the, the, the incompetence of the American media is a subject that never ceases to astound me. Um, uh, and, uh, and Mexico is going to need to do that, but it's not going to be able to do it under this administration. My biggest fear right now is that AMLO is going to try to tinker with the Constitution to get rid of what are known as the the six year the six year 
uh, the six year term limited presidency to install himself as a, as a president for a longer period of time. Um, and that would, that would never mind Colombia, that would be the Venezuelization of uh, Mexican life. So we ought to be paying attention. And one of the things that I think is depressing about the last few years is that we've become a very inward looking country. It's, I think, difficult for Americans to stop and think there's a world out there and what happens there affects us at home. You have been a champion of uh, the American, uh, the use of American power in defense of liberal ideals. Uh, I wonder how you think about that in the context of Mexico, particularly. Of course, when you think about AMLO himself, uh, you know, the idea of being the kind of nationalist defender of Mexico sovereignty is a big part of his, you know, kind of uh, political rise. Uh, so perhaps there's a danger there. But do you believe that there's a case for a more assertive U.S. role? Certainly not sending the U.S. military to, to kind of, you know, uh, defend the rule of law, things that the Mexican government ought to do for itself. Uh, but do you see a place, you know, given um, the extent of our economic influence, for example, uh, in order to nudge Mexico in the direction uh, of more constructive policies that will be better for its own citizens and, and therefore perhaps have knock-on benefits for us? Or do you think that that would be foolish uh, given the possibility of a kind of uh, rally around the flag, uh, you know, kind of nationalist reaction in Mexico? I, I think it's very difficult for the United States to ass assert or insert itself into Mexican politics in a way that isn't welcomed by the Mexican government. And the AMLO government has already uh, cut longstanding ties to the DEA um, that uh, have have had have had an effect. Um, uh, so again, the, the the limitation is what the Mexican government is uh, is prepared to do, and with this particular administration, that's that's going to be very very limited. So we're going to find ourselves. I mean, when you think of crises that are coming our way, people talk about Taiwan in twenty seven. People should be thinking about Mexico in twenty four when there's the next, presumably the next uh, changeover in power. Now to a question from Annie. What should U.S. policymakers ask of U.S. companies vis-a-vis -vis China? And is that a fatal difference between our current competition and the Cold War? American businesses were very interested in the defeat of communism. They're less eager to forego profits in mainland China. I suppose we could quibble over whether you know, U.S. companies were fully invested in, in the struggle to defeat the Soviet Union, but, but, but I'm curious how you think about that. Is it illiberal for the U.S. government to expect U.S. companies to uh, advance U.S. strategic objectives when it comes to China? Uh, yeah, it's a difficult question to answer. I think my, my impression from just talking to business leaders who have been dealing with China is they are um, they are increasingly wary of uh, of doing business in the PRC just because of theft of intellectual property, strong arming of local executives, uh, the disappearance of a lot of high level executives into God knows where Chinese uh, 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 Chinese prisons. And so, um, I mean, I, I, what I suspect part of the question has to do with is things like the NBA and. Uh, Disney or other, you know, uh, entertainment companies that are essentially tailoring their product to suit the the needs of of uh, Chinese censors. Um, and you know, look, obviously, that I think it's outrageous when I mean, I have an eleven year old child, and we saw the the new Mulan movie uh, not too long ago, which just struck me as. Han propaganda. I mean, like, you know, with all the villains seem to be Uyghurs, right? Or, you know, that that there was almost a, a kind of a racialized aspect to the the bad guys in uh uh in 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 the film. And that's just one example among uh uh among many. But yeah, I think look, American companies need to abide by American laws, and American laws need to become very strict uh when it comes to never mind intellect, you know an intellectual property, but also the risks of sharing um, technologies that end up uh, having national security consequences for the United States. I would just expand on that and say that the U.S. also needs to do that uh, worldwide. Uh, the Chinese are very active in terms of acquiring uh, very sophisticated technologies from American allies abroad. Um, and so we need a kind of a global policy here. 
uh, brief brief note here. Um, I think when we look back on all the things that were terrible about the Trump administration, uh, one of them is a Trump administration that was so, in many ways, so hostile and heavy handed when it came to our trade agreements with our partners in Europe, that they have helped drive um, much of Europe into uh, an increasingly um, an increasingly deeper economic and technological partnership with uh, with the Chinese. That's very true in the case of uh, uh, case of Germany, but other countries as well. Our sway in Europe uh, is much less than it used to be. Maybe some of that is natural, but I think that the 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 extent to which Trump enraged, needlessly provoked and enraged our European allies was one of the great own goals of American policy. Given that we have a presumable interest in um, uh, in containing uh, and defeating Chinese misbehavior. Two questions that I will ask together as they are somewhat related. Mm -hmm. The first is from Benny. Brett talks about the need to more fully assimilate Israeli Arabs into the Israeli mainstream. Is there a limit on this project because of Israel's commitment to maintaining its Jewish character? And then a question from David. What does Brett think about arguments from the left for a one state solution, an argument for Israel for all of its citizens. Is there, there should not be a theoretical limit, right? I mean, it's uh, uh, obviously Israel is not gonna be able to maintain its Jewish character unless it maintains a healthy, you know, Jewish demographic advantage through a uh, combination of immigration and, and, uh, and a, uh, a birth rate, right? That is, you know, uh, positive and that matches or overmatches other, other birth rates. What I've seen from demographic studies is that um, the Jewish side of Israel is is doing that, um, but Israel is also a democracy and a state for all of its citizens. Uh, so you know, to the extent look, the Arab world also doesn't want to lose its the Arab Israelis don't want to lose their own cultural uh, identity, and this this has been you know an open question for now seventy three years that Israel's been in existence. Uh, and the Israelis have been able to handle it, but they will handle it better if Arab Israelis feel like they are, think of themselves as Israelis first and, and Arabs uh, second. Um, I, I should also add there's work within the Arab communities that they also need to do to, to, to reach that kind of uh, 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 frame of mind. But we could, my, my simple point is that the country could do a lot better, uh, creating sort of cultural openings and economic opportunities for a part of the population that has been, for a variety of reasons, walled off from the mainstream. The idea of a one-state solution is insane, dangerous, uh, and wrong. Um, and I've actually seen it argued by people I consider crazy right-wingers, not just crazy left-wingers, crazy right-wingers who say, well, let's just make every, give a hand a passport to um, uh, all, uh, all Palestinians and maintain the current uh, the current borders as a as a sovereign state fundamentally threatens Jew Israel's Jewish demographic uh, character in a way that the Israeli Arab issue um, uh, uh, does not. And on the left side of the equation, the idea that you know Israel is going to thrive as a second version of Lebanon, um, well, just look at Lebanon. Look at Lebanon right now. Uh, it's a it's a failed state and a disastrously and tragically. Uh, failed state. So ideally, the outcome at some point is a two-state solution. The question is, will the second state, will a future Palestinian state look more like Costa Rica? That is to say, small but beautiful, progressive in the best sense of the word, democratic, demilitarized, <laughs> right? Or is it going to look more like uh, Yemen or Lebanon? Uh, and uh, it's only going to look more like Costa Rica if you get a new generation of Palestinian leaders who don't want to carry on an endless and bloody and ultimately fruitless struggle against their neighbors, but want to have a fruitful coexistence with a technologically sophisticated and relatively wealthy neighbor that can be that can be an asset to them, um, and that that requires, in my view, a kind of a culture shift uh, in in Palestinian society. People think, well, that's that's crazy. That'll never happen. But nobody thought that. Israel would be making peace with the United Arab Emirates. Nobody thought that countries like uh, Germany and Japan would be um, 
you know, essentially pacifist countries, uh, um, cultures change. Uh, that's 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 a historical reality too, and they don't change by themselves, but they change when they're pushed to change, when they have to change. Um, and that's that's what we should be thinking about, however long term the project may be. That's what we ought to be thinking about vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. At some point, the Jewish Israel or or Israel is going to have to have some kind of good separation from the Palestinians, and. Right now, the crisis is, you know, what, what's, what's happening in Israel is like, imagine a plane that's circling in the air, has plenty of gas, but it's slowly running out of fuel, and it's looking for a runway. It can't just land anywhere. And, you know, what, the problem with the left today is that they just say, look, one day we're going to run out of fuel, so you got to land the plane. And the right is saying, well, we're never, or the far right is saying, we're never going to run out of fuel, we're going to just remain in the air forever. So if you'll accept this metaphor, there has to be a landing strip somewhere. Eventually there has to be a kind of a separation, but whether you land on the strip or uh, 30 meters to the right or left makes all the difference between survival and destruction. So hopefully uh, at some point there will be a good landing. Brett, we only have a few minutes left, so I will abuse my moderator's privilege by asking mm -hmm. you one last question. You've recently added a new job to your CV, as we mentioned earlier on, you're editing a new journal, Sapir, which covers political, theological, and cultural topics relevant to Jewish life. What are the questions you're hoping to address? What are you trying to accomplish with the journal? And you know, what is a, a very fragmented, um, very, uh, in many ways, disappointing media landscape? Well, it's not a new job in the sense that this is a four, we're doing four issues. Um, it's, an, it's a scholarly and, uh, uh, philanthropic and cultural endeavor to uh, think deeply about some topics of interest to me as, uh, as a Jew. Um, so it's, it's, it's very personal as well. Uh, our first issue was uh, talk, looked at the subject of social justice from a variety of angles. We had uh, four very distinguished, uh, was it four? Yeah, I think four very distinguished rabbis uh, uh, weighing in. We had uh, academics, uh, a few voices from Israel. People, by the way, number of voices from the political left, not just from uh, uh, from the political right. Uh, the the aim is really to sort of talk to Jewish thought leaders about how to address something that's clearly on the minds of uh, the Jewish community in terms of how it looks at social justice issues and how it can look at them in a way that is true to our uh, our our liberal aspirations. I mean, liberal in the broad sense as well as our Jewish aspirations. The second issue is gonna be about power, um, power in the Jewish community. Uh, the third issue is going to be about continuity in terms of education, philanthropy, and so on. And the fourth issue is, to be, is, uh, is TBD. Uh, and again, uh, it's so it's, you know, people say job, it's, it's something that I'm doing. Um, I know that it's been, you know, on Twitter uh, in this kind of preposterously exaggerated form, but anyone who bothers to look at what what it is, you can go uh, you can go to the to to uh, see look, look for Sapir on I'm trying to remember the name of the URL. I should know it by heart, but if you look for Sapir, you'll see uh, fourteen. I think very good, uh, thought provoking, and ideologically and intellectually um, uh, diverse. Um, pieces of thoughtful essay writing. And, um, and if it sparks some interesting or, or creative thinking in the Jewish world, that's, that's the essential idea behind it. We, I work with some terrific colleagues and it's, been, it's a fun project to do. Uh, the URL is sapirjournal.org. And I encourage you to visit the issue on social justice was brilliant. Uh, really illuminating. Uh, and also this conversation has been really illuminating. We've covered an incredibly wide range of topics uh, in a very short amount of time. I'm so grateful to you, Brett, for joining us. And I hope we'll be able to see you again soon. Uh, for everyone, I encourage you to keep your eyes peeled, not just for Sapir Journal, but also for Brett's column in the New York Times. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, this has been really terrific. Pleasure. Thank you.